I'm just going to include a brief mention there. This is a marked error from the Public Library of Science, or FOSS, or SLOTS, as they used to be called years ago when they started, which is very unfair. Uh, moving beyond the impact. Oh, you changed your title. Yeah, I changed my title and I already realized too late that there's the word impact and story in there. So this was not to say anything good or bad about that organization. But it's about the same kind of issues that they worry about. And I'm very thankful not only to be invited by Joe and Graham that, that Ewan and Stephen spoke before me because I think I try to do similar things with a different perspective. So I think there's a nice fit and I look forward to the discussion. Um, and I want to start with an event that happens once a year and everybody goes crazy about numbers. And that's not what happened yesterday with the announcement of impact factors by Thomson Reuters, but it's something that happened a few weeks ago and that in the tweet stream always creates confusion for people who are in the US because what's this crazy stuff going on there? Um, and of course, this is a competition about what's the best song in this thing. And um, there's a winner and a loser, and of course, the Swedish guy won this year, and Germany was last with zero points, and I think the UK was not much better. <laughs> and so the question is, is this a reflection of quality? So was this just a much better song, or was it not? And I think, I mean, I, you will see in a moment why I start with this. And there are lots of factors that go into winning, and of course, the obvious ones are, um, you have to have this certain style of Europop, um, which means everybody's singing English now, even if you're from Russia or um, so forth. Um, really depends on where you're from. So if you're from a small country, maybe there's three people applying and that's easy to get into competition, but it's much harder to win than whereas countries like Sweden, I think it's a very tough job to be sent to Vienna in this case. And of course, you can do marketing, which for music means you just play it on the radio. And of course, there's this game in the competition about neighboring countries giving votes to each other. And there's other factors. What I learned in the lunch break under the conversation is, of course, the, the video animation here played a role. And of course, the biggest factor of all is you have to be attractive to 12 to 18 year old females to get votes. Um, if you move to science, and this is just one example of a paper that Floss published last week. I cannot show a paper of nature or cell, et cetera, because then I would have to pay money to show the slide. Um, but it doesn't really matter. What I want to point out is what makes good research. Um, and it's not really just, oh, this is a good piece of work. And um, Stephen talked about a few things that are really had an impact. CRISPR is an interesting story because the one of the people involved in this is a colleague of my wife and I see all the crazy things around that and it's really um, fascinating. Um, so of course, if you do research in a topic that lots of people care about, it's, it's much easier to get published. So if you, rather than doing some obscure research, especially if it's hot and trendy topic, whatever that means, um, it helps if you're a researcher that has a name associated with or an institution or if you have published in a journal that has a brand or an impact factor that this, for some reason, makes the research better. And of course, it helps if you're well expected in the community, so if you get talks at conference and people like that. So there, the point I want to make is there's lots of things that go into sort of success of research which are totally unrelated to the quality. And I think it's very obvious that you don't take quality too serious in an event like um, this annual song competition. The fun part of this was I was in Australia watching this live and of course Australia participated for the first time and I think Australia is just perfect for this event. <laughs> it's just the kind of music I think they enjoy. Um, but of course that's a fun event and maybe there's some marketing money etc. But science it's a deadly business about careers and funding etc. And then I think it's not so funny anymore. And I think this is basically this is the first slide you showed. You cannot quantify the quality of research. Um, and of course what we do, we use proxies. So something that relates to quality but it's something else. And the first proxy, um, which we have to remember, good research is sort of melted down to research output and specifically journal articles. So if you do great work for three years, you discover lots of things that you never publish as nobody notices that. Even though there might be a lot of benefit by talking to other people, collaborating for, or for other projects. Or if you have a research output which is not a journal article, maybe it's data or it's 
software, then maybe again, that's usually not a proxy for quality. Um, and of course, because we cannot measure quality, we use impact. Um, and that's sort of the popularity among peers, which means your scientific colleagues, what they think about your work, that makes your work good or bad. And that's of course a very dangerous assumption because if you have a lot of peers because you work in a big field, it's much easier to have impact than if there are only 10 people working on this field. Um, and of course, the proxy for the attention or <coughs> the popularity among your peers then is citations, which is again one step, um, which includes there's a delay until you see the citations. There might be other ways of your colleagues liking your work, but they're not citing you. For example, if you do engineering or medical research, um, then it's somewhere else. And of course, it's not just citations, but it's even worse, it's citations in selected journals because they're indexing services that index a list of journals and that is a selection. And that means, for example, if you publish in a language which is not English, then you're out of luck. Then you don't get citations and nobody cares. Of course, probably also nobody's reading your work because you don't speak Chinese, but um, just the awareness that there's a selection process going on and if you're interested in a high H index, you just use the service that indexes the most journals. So you use Google Scholar instead of uh, Web of Science, for example. Um, we, we try, we have started to think social media metrics could use as a proxy for social impact. They somehow reflect this, there's a correlation, but we have to be very conscious that this is a proxy. So it's not the same thing. Um, and then we make one step further instead of citation for an article, we go to the citation for the journal and we, don't, we use the mean for whatever reason. Um, and in the end, we come up with something very different. So instead of describing the quality list dog, we have done so many steps of approximating and proxying out that it looks totally different. Um, and it might be a nice thing, but uh, it's something else. Um, and all this proxying leads to, to two problems. One is that there are many serious problems with both the theory behind all this, what we're doing, and also the practical applications. And number two, uh, all the intended unintended consequences, and that's sort of um, getting to topics that came up today already. Um, this is a list of a very nice presentation that <coughs> Paul Waters and <coughs> Wolfgang Glenzel, so the same Paul Waters who was um, one of the authors of the Leiden Manifesto, a bibliometrician. And this is, was a list of 10 things you should do and not do to use metrics to access individuals, which is very different from using metrics for institutions or journals, etc. And um, this list looks really funny if, you, if you're a bibliometrician, but the problem is that you see a lot of this out in the real world. And a good example is um, the idea, and I've seen this myself, if you publish in a journal that has an impact factor above five or 10 or whatever, you get a give the graduate student a prize. If the journal has an impact factor of 9.95, that's sort of there's some magical step you make there so you don't get a prize. And that's sort of one of many examples of doing really crazy things. Um, another example is weighting co-authorship. I mean, co-authorship is very tricky and the idea that you can have a formula or that you're a second author or a fifth author that there's a different weight, that's just not really founded in, in real numbers. Um, and this is a longer list and it's, it's quite helpful and it's sort of a lot of things you, you know but you, that they are crazy but you see them happen. Um, the un unintended consequence is something I really like um, because it's really shows you that we all have best intention and we end up in something else and I think you refer to that. Um, and of course the first thing that happens if you have a proxy, everybody's going to the, toward that goal and if, if it's sort of if you get your promotion or your next grant, if you do this and that, then you do that. And if it means publish in a specific group of journals, then you do that. If it means, for example, your institution says you should publish, we just count how many papers you publish per year, we don't care where you do that, then you do that, etc. cetera. Um, another big problem is that um, the direct and indirect costs 
are just increasing. And that's not just the cost of doing an assessment exercise, but it's also indirect cost. If you submit a paper to four journals before it's accepted because you think the paper is somehow better if it's published in a particular journal, then you would spend two years on that, and that's just time and money. Um, of course, there are also other consequences that people cannot read your work before it's published, etc. But that's an unintended consequence. Um, to start with a journal really want to go into first and then you go sort of to other journals until finally um, accepted. Another unintended consequence is that the whole business of impact assessment becomes sort of self-sustained. And I think a good example is this group, so, uh, this room. So we briefly mentioned this. I don't know how many people in this room do research and how many people in this room evaluate research. And if we talk to each other, of course, all this stuff is important. We should spend more money on impact assessment. We should do this and that, etc. And that's sort of, of course, self-fulfilling because we are, it takes a life on its own. Um, and something that really worries me, which is, if you think about it, it's pretty obvious, but it's, you don't see it immediately, that instead of peers deciding who is good or bad and who should get this job or this grant, it's somebody else. And it's really funny that academics have given this over for the most part to journal editors who now decide what's good research by accepting or not accepting a paper and that's what you take for granted instead of having your own opinion. And also administrators play into this that there's some numbers you can generate and that's why you should hire X or Y. Um, and of course um, with all these factors pushing researchers into doing stuff, and I totally agree, uh, we all do this because that's how you survive in such a system. Of course, um, what happens is that the whole system gets distorted because you're just, there's a discrepancy what good research should look like and what should we should aim for and what the sort of incentives are. And if that's sort of misaligned, then we have a problem. I think we have a big problem. For me, incentive system in science is one of the biggest problems we have right now. And that I'm probably not alone with this assessment. So I think um, we have to stop that. I'm not sure we do this tonight, but um, the solution is not, hey, let's find a new fact impact factor two, which is a little bit better because it does, I don't know, medians instead of means, or go to optic level citation, now we solve all the problem, because the, the problem is still the same that using metrics to do something will always mean, among other things, people follow that path. Um, of course, that's not where I want to stop, but rather, well, is there something we can do? Um, and I think the first step, especially if you're, um, if you're working in this business of collecting this information or analyzing this information, um, is you should be honest and responsible. And I think Dora, is a good example of many things that you should do or not do. And I mentioned this earlier about the 10 do's and don'ts of assessment. I think there's a, a small, or maybe a bigger disconnect be between the bibliometrics community that does a lot of research understanding these things and sort of communicating this to researchers and research administrators. So they all have sort of come up with their own ways of looking at these numbers. Um, and I think what is in particular important is sort of the false sense of accuracy here's a number, and that is what it means. And if it's three digits after the period, it's that accurate, and you can do, and you refer to that in your university ranking, that's a false sense of accuracy. Um, another big problem is aggregation. So this means not only aggregating articles into a journal and using one number for that, but also aggregating um, different things, which could, for example, be different, so, uh, a preprint and the final published paper. So let's throw all citations together, which makes sense, but we don't know whether the preprint actually looks very different from the accepted paper because there was a lot of change. Um, and of course, aggregation in many other ways um, is, is dangerous. Um, I think it helps to be open. So if you provide these data, like we do at PLOS, you should make the data openly available and you should uh, make openly available how you, you calculated this uh, and how you generate the data. And I think at PLOS we try to do that to our best, but there's one area where we don't do that currently, and that's how we collect tweets. That's an application we wrote, but that's not 
open source, so it's really difficult for someone to understand why does PLOS have these tweets and Optometric.com has another list of tweets. Um, and of course, being open doesn't mean there's no business, uh, but the business shouldn't be uh, in the data, but the business should be in the services around them. So for example, what Optometric is doing is providing a lot of useful information and visualizing this in a nice way in context, <coughs> et cetera. Uh, I think it would help <coughs> to have a great set of principles. I think DORA is very nice, but one problem <coughs> I see with DORA, it's not all stakeholders. So the group of people that came together, which agreed on something, but it didn't bring anybody on board. So I would be would have been happier, and maybe that can happen in the future, if there's a DORA <coughs> light, which, which sort of, I'm getting there. So which is maybe, less strong in a few opinions, but everybody agrees with that, so that this is a common understanding. <coughs> and the first one is already, I think that was your first slide, so that's, at least in this room, it's agreeable. Um, and also, I think you hear this a lot, but I think it's not really stated. You can only research, researchers can only evaluate by other researchers, not by somebody who counts numbers. And that these proxy indicators, they're all very nice, but they are just help and nothing else. And the problem is we all say that, but at the end of the day, we are lazy and we cut corners and we just take the number 10. Um, and something that is really important, and I say this with my sort of non-UK perspective, is the idea that you can have an exercise of assessing quality using proxy indicators, and then you can say, well, next year we have 10% less science funding, so let's just only fund the 90 90% best research, and we, we can sort of do that by going through the numbers. I think you should separate this out. If you don't have enough money to fund research, that's a problem, but uh, the idea that instead of making tough decisions, you do the sort of objective metrics business that's not going to work because it's always a decision how you weight everything, etc. and that should be clear. Um, we need best practices, and I think that's the next last slide. And a good example is the work NISO is doing, and I'm happy to talk more about this in discussion. And I think we should also set a speed limit. Uh, we shouldn't use 50% of our budget to evaluate research and 50% to do the research, but the, the ratio should be more reasonable. Um, and let's like, make this the last slide. If you use proxies and the sort of the distortion, you take them to your advantage. So if you're a funder and you want to promote publication of research data and you just tell everybody you only get grants if you do that and then people will do that and that's a policy decision but it's totally different from metrics and good research and with that I stop thank you thank you Dr. Fenner do we have time for a couple of questions I think Peter thank you um, I was reminded uh, in your comments about um, the individual author or authors, because I think the default we should always take is that a given paper has more than one author from more than one institution and often more than one country. I think we just should take that as the default. But anyway, that instance relative to the journal uh, reminded me of work that went on on what was called school effects. So it was looking at um, pupil performance in school and the extent to which schools made a difference. And there was an awful lot of analysis where pupil results, examination results typically, were aggregated up at school level. And then these school level uh, statistics were used relative to education authorities or to policy, etc., etc. And it was awful. And there was a big round because people recognized that the agency of effect, the things that they were really interested in, was the pupil performance. And you had something about the researcher, the author, something about the article, given that it's a combination, it's quite complicated. But if they're looking at that, I think that some degree of sophistication of the different levels of analysis has to enter into it. And I think we're alluding to that, but there are some models of thinking in the school effects world, of something like 10 number of years ago. So if people are curious, there is work to be drawn on. I don't know whether you've come across that. That might be my question. But, uh, 
Well, I, I said I, I think I take this as a comment. It's helpful. I probably have to read up on that. Can I, can I take away your solace? Uh, you can only measure the quality of research by peers. Uh, because the experiences of peers are allowed to be measured in the quality of research. Mm -hmm. When funding institutions introduce uh, uh, quality standards for grant applications, they end up pulling their hair out because because their peer reviewers don't apply the policy. And where research is generally of low quality, and in many areas it is, you just reinforce the status quo and there's no room for improvement at all. And you know in force that you've adopted the ARRIVE guidelines. You tell your peer reviewers that they should address the ARRIVE guidelines in their peer review, and nobody does it. So relying on peers is not a way to assess the quality of work, because peers don't know what makes good research. I would just answer that I know that there are many problems with peers reviewing their colleagues, both if, as peer review in a journal article or for a grant or job application, but that still doesn't take away the message that you can generate as many numbers as, as you want, but at the end of the day, somebody has to look at them and who else could do that if not somebody who can actually read the paper from the job office and understand what he's doing. I don't really see how you can do this any other way. Um, What's definitely needed is a better quality control of peer review. And one way, of course, to do this is to do this more open and not behind closed doors and you never know what somebody is saying. Okay, that's what we probably do. Thank you again. Marco. Uh, 